Then a uh, much different kind of approach than in class, so hopefully it'll go quicker and whatnot. Um, I've played with a different, couple of different things, and so we're just going to do the PowerPoint here with the voiceover. Um, I think it's going to help with the uploads and whatnot. It's been kind of frustrating getting this going, which I anticipated. Um, but, you know, we, I, I told you we'd run up with it and we'd run with it. So um, this will allow you the opportunity to kind of walk through and, and see some of the highlights of what I tend to focus on. Um, whereas we're going to lean on Words We Live By by Linda R. Monk for a lot of the kind of nitty gritty stuff. And so without further ado, um, these online lectures are going to be rather quick. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of your time on them because we are going to read and do these. But um, it's important to kind of go over some of the nuances that aren't discussed very well in the book. So this first one is really going to center on um, the, the legislature and, and what the legislature can be and what the legislature should be. And so as we begin to develop this kind of conceptual understanding of the legislature, it's important to kind of remember that we had these kind of two different elements of the legislature, one in the representation and one in the Senate. And the idea, if you remember from the Federalist Papers, was that they were supposed to be different chambers. They were supposed to be populated by different people, different groups, different ideas, and that they were really supposed to kind of balance each other out. So if I have this kind of balancing act, they were supposed to balance each other out. So what may manifest in the House may not manifest in the Senate and vice versa. And we had um, the different considerations in the Senate that would balance out the House and the different considerations of the House that would balance out the Senate. And so this was really, really important to understand. Um, most of this is pretty straightforward in the writing, so I'm not going to go through it. The big points on this one um, is keep in mind that currently we have 435 members there we go, 35 members of the House of Representatives, and we have 100 members of the Senate. Um, so if we take those in collectively, it means we have effectively 535 members of what we call Congress, and Congress is the term we have used to apply for both of them. If you have more than half, or 50% plus one of the House, you control the House, looking from a political point of view. If you control 51 votes in the Senate, you control the Senate. Um, and so a lot of times we look at these kind of elements of control um, simply by looking at uh, those elements of uh, how many votes we need in one side or the other. What you'll also notice is that the qualifications for the House of Representatives are notably lower than the qualifications for the Senate. Once again, the Senate was designed to be a more prestigious body, a more experienced body, a more long-standing body. Um, even the six-year term of senators is the largest elected term um, of any office um, that we have elections for. The president only has four um, year terms and the Supreme Court have life appointments, but they're not actually elected. So it really was the Senate that was supposed to be kind of the stabilizing force for government. However, it was also the Senate that we took down as a mass people group in the early 20th century uh, when we kind of argued that it was a millionaire's club, um, argued that rich people had taken over, and we put a lot of the... Um, the electoral um, holdings back on the people for the Senate as well as the House. Um, and in so many ways, this balance that was designed to happen between the Senate and the House um, was effectively attacked when we took away um, the state's ability to elect their own senators. Um, and the consequences of that are, are consequences that we really haven't uh, fully realized, um, even though we are seeing overwhelmingly um, the demands of the people manifesting in government really kind of destabilize our nation. Um, nobody needs to look further than the national debt uh, to really see how, how the people have overwhelmingly stewarded poorly um, financial matters of the federal government. And so uh, what we have is Article 1, Section 1 begins the legislative power. Um, and the important thing here is this notion of all legislative power here and granted. No other branch of government is given this limitation. And so the founding fathers are going to specifically tell us that we are going to give this new government power, the power to make law, which are those moral confinements of our nation. And within that moral power, we're going to dramatically shift and restrain it by telling it specifically in the Constitution what it can do. And so this kind of notion of the legislative power here and granted suggests that anything the federal government is intended to do, it needs to be listed in the Constitution. And so in many ways, that argument right there is a profound kind of indication that this is supposed to be a limited government, that the government of the United States is not supposed to be 
unlimited or without restraint. So a lot of what we're putting on the government today really doesn't fall into this intention and really doesn't fall into this original of here and granted. To understand the here and granted, we're really going to have to look at the powers that they gave Congress uh, to see what was the intention for Congress to do. Um, and so we see that kind of play out. Again, this is all review. We've already talked about the House of Representatives having a certain identity there, the Senate having an identity, and the idea here is to balance out these um, groups so that nothing is kind of manifesting as the moral narrative of our nation unless we see these traditionally warring factions of societies agree on what should be done at this level. And so for this first lecture, we're really going to go into the House of Representatives and look at how do we actually select representatives. Um, section two says the House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every six year by the people of several states. So this is the only branch of government that the people are going to directly select. Um, all other branches of government puts a medium between the people and the branch of government. Uh, remember, the Senate was originally selected by the state legislature. The presidency is elected by the Electoral College, and the Supreme Court is appointed by the presidency. So the only branch of government that has a direct connection to the people is Congress, but it's not even full Congress. It's only one half of Congress in the House of Representatives. Now, the Senate today is also directly elected by the people, but remember that doesn't happen until the 17th Amendment is passed in the early 20th century. And so today, the whole of Congress is dependent upon the people, but at the time of the Constitution, it was just the House of Representatives, right? The qualifications are relatively low, this is something that a lot of people uh, kind of get on. Uh, they want to say we need term limits. Uh, we need to kick them out. My question is maybe we need to look at qualifications. Um, during this time period, the average lifespan was something like 54 years old. Um, and so we're looking at somebody that was like half as old. I mean, you, you could look at 40 years old being kind of the minimum qualifications. Um, at the time period, you only had about 4%, 2, two to 4% of the nation had college degrees. Today, we have dramatically more. Uh, than that. So um, instead of looking at term limits, which may actually cause more trouble, um, why don't we look at the qualifications here and ask ourselves kind of like, what would be a reasonable qualification for somebody who is really kind of selling us that they're going to go make national law? Uh, this is a consideration I think we kind of need to focus on. Nonetheless, when we look at how do we select, right, the argument is effectively this, and some of this is in the book, I'm not going to detail it too much, but the general idea is this. We need to select representation, and that representation is going to come from individuals that are grouped together at the state level. Um, in a sense, if we're going to look at this from a map point of view, if I'm going to have 435 members of the, uh, of the House of Representatives, then I have to take the United States of America and I have to divide it into 435 different groups. Um, this is what's called a single member district, right? Sorry, my pen is not wanting to work. Um, so the single member district is going to say that every district or group, all a district is, is a group. So every district or group is going to select one person within that group to go to Washington and represent them. So this becomes a little bit complicated because if we have 435 members of Congress, that means I have to break up the United States in 435 equal number groups. And that's complicated to do because the people of the United States are always growing and always moving. We are constantly doing this. So there's really two steps to what we call this redistricting, this grouping process. The first part of it is what we call reapportionment. The Reapportionment Act of 1929 sets a number at 435 and says that every representative must represent roughly the same number of Americans. So what happens is I have to count the number of Americans to figure out just how many Americans are in each group and where those groups are. Um, if you ever remember the census, this is exactly what we have, right? Um, it says, 
says that Congress of the United States within every subsequent term of 10 years. So this idea of the enumeration, the effective count of Congress shall be determined every 10th year when we basically go in the United States and we count. So every 10th year we go and we count. Where is everybody living? And so the first part of this is we award states a certain number of this 435 based on how many or what percentage of the population lives in that state. Now, every state has to have at least one. Every state has to have at least one. Beyond that one, states are awarded based on roughly their population. So if 8% of the US population lives in Texas, then in theory, Texas is given 8% of the 435 members of Congress. And that's effectively how that works out. You take the 435 members, multiply it by the 8%, and you get a number. Now, this is done every 10th year, and then states are then required to draw the district. So the first step of this is reapportionment. It's when the federal government runs a census, and then they decide how many representatives each state gets. Now, the important thing to understand here is because of the population demographics in the United States, we are effectively moving west and south, right? So this is the census of 2000. In 2000, the states in orange actually lost a representative. In other words, they lost the ability to control a vote in Congress, while the, uh, while the states in blue gained a vote in Congress or gained the ability to control that vote. And I'll explain how states control these votes here in a minute. But for right now, it's important to understand that in national politics, we are seeing a growth of power in the West and the South, and that power is being lost in the traditional moving and shaking parts of our nation. So the p places of our nation that have traditionally moved the legislative ability, they're losing power because they're losing population. If I tie votes all right, to the number of people living in a state, then those votes are going to go where the people go. And so right now, they're leaving New England and they're flowing south and west, right? So when we look at this, it, it was actually more dramatic than the last one showed. Because if I'm going to look at what happened in 2010, these nation or these states right here that are in the light green, all of them lost one, right? The dark green, they lost two. Louisiana lost one because of Hurricane Katrina. The light blue here, they're all going to gain one. And so you begin looking at this becomes a zero-sum game. So a state can't gain one unless another state loses. Florida gains two votes and Texas gained four. Right, So you're seeing this shift that's happening, and if you're ever wondering why Texas is becoming a big hotspot issue in national politics, this is why. California has historically been the mover and shaker in modern times because of the growth of California really since the 1950s to today. But California lately, for a lot of reasons, has actually stagnated in population and has recently declined, which I'll show you here in a minute. While Texas continues to grow, Florida's continuing growing, Parts of the South are continuing growing. Western states are continuing growing. Now, this is important, remember, because whoever gets these votes, are awarded these votes, the states themselves get to decide the groups. And deciding the groups can go a long way in deciding who controls Congress. And so this is what happened in 2020. So the last slide I showed you was 2010. This one is 2020. So 10 years later, what are we seeing again? Once again, 10 years later, we're seeing the traditional movers and shakers of the American government losing power, and this power is flowing once again to the South and to the West, with the notable exception of California. For the first time in California's history, California lost a vote. Now, once again, this is important to note because of all of the votes that are moving, Texas continues to have a greater say in the national political arena or making those national standards. Florida has a growing voice. North Carolina has a growing voice. All the while, these traditional movers and shakers are losing a certain power of that. So the first part of this equation is what we call reapportionment. We take the census. We decide how many votes go to each state. 
And the second part um, of this is going to be um, redistricting. And so this is overwhelmingly just kind of what I was saying um, with the map on looking at where has been or where has been, uh, what has been the traditional population shift of the United States. In 1990, it was very clear that the Midwest and the Northeast overwhelmingly kind of dominated the majority of the House of Representatives because they dominated the majority of where people lived in the United States. As we project out to 2030, that is shifting to the South and to the West. And so this is an important shift that's happening in American politics. Um, and we're seeing this shift kind of manifest in um, the notion of what type of moral standards are manifesting in the federal government. So a lot of times um, we look at a lot of reasons why we're seeing different laws passed or different folks and whatnot, um, or the balance of power is, this is why, right? If you're gonna look at this, you have to look at where the people are moving and these are where the battlegrounds are going to be. And so the second part of this is what we call redistricting, right? After um, the state of Texas, and, and you can laugh at me accordingly, right? There you go. Um, after the state of Texas gets, the federal government says you get 38. Well, the state legislature, our state of Texas legislature in Austin, they get to decide how our state is broken up in those 38. So the federal government decides the number, the state decides the groups. So once the state of Texas is given 38 representatives, it is the state of Texas that then gets to decide how those 38 are broken up. And so we effectively have to take the state of Texas and break it into 38 groups. So for the federal house members, we break it into 38 groups, but we also break it into 150 groups for our own house of representatives, which is a people based elect or a people, um, the people elect our own house at the state level as well. The state senate district, we have 31 of those. Um, state board of education, we have 15 of those. And so we basically take the state of Texas, um, which is right now roughly 30 million people, and we take that 30 million and divide it by 38, we divide it by 150, we divide it by 31, and we divide it by 15, and we create all these different groupings, which confuses the hell out of a lot of people because you end up with, in a lot of different groups. You are simultaneously a member of a house district. You are also a member of a state house district. You are also a member of a state senate district. You're also a member of a state board of education district, and these get really confusing really, really quickly. So the important point here is, is not to go in depth all the districts, but to really kind of accentuate how these districts are drawn. And to that end, we have to look at gerrymandering. Um, gerrymandering is essentially the political practice of using groupings to determine an outcome, right? And the way we do that isn't really rigging election, but it is. It's not but it is. Um, and so here's how it works. The first thing I have to do is I have to have a predictable reliability on how different people are going to vote. If I know which people vote and how they vote, then I'm allowed to use their predictable vote to a certain predictable end. Um, I will tell you right now, if you want to get rid of gerrymandering, stop voting single party. If you would stop voting single party, if we as Americans would stop voting single party, gerrymandering would be impossible because we wouldn't be able to predict the likely outcome of the vote. But if I can predict the outcome of a vote that is going to be Democrat or Republican, then I can navigate how that vote is likely to end based on how I draw the groups. So let me show you how this is done. In this one, I have 50 people and this 50 group of 50 I have 60% blue voters and 40% red voters. I am given five votes, all right? So now I have to take my 50 people and I have to divide them in five groups, which means every group has roughly 10 voters. And because these are single member districts, every 10 voters gets to elect one. So I can group these individuals in any group of 10 I want to, so long as they're continuous, they have to be connecting, right? And each one group is going to elect one person from that group, right? Well, I can do this a lot of different ways. I can do it like this and group all the red in group one. I can guarantee if all 10 of these go to vote, all 10 of them vote red, their one representative is gonna vote red. The second one, all 10 of them vote red. Once again, I get a red. 
all 10 Democrats, they're going to vote Democrat. Same thing here. They're going to vote Democrat and they're going to vote Democrat. Now, why is this important? Because remember, you need 50% of the vote plus one. If you have five voters, five representative votes, that means you need 50%, which is two plus one, equaling three. Once a party gets to three votes, they control the moral narrative. And so if I'm in this situation, it really doesn't matter that the party in red has two votes. The party in blue controls the process, right? So this other one, they argue compact but unfair. I disagree for a lot of reasons and I'll explain why. Um, in this scenario, notice how I still have groups of 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I still have groups of 10. Every group of 10 still has to elect one representative. But in this group, I have six votes I have six votes for blue, and I have four votes for red. So blue wins, blue wins, blue wins, blue wins, blue wins. And so in this iteration, simply by structuring how the groups are drawn, I have guaranteed that blue now has five votes in the moral making process, right? Whereas red votes has none. Now, this is taken from the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, one of the two, and they argue that this is compact but unfair. I disagree. I actually would rather have this if I was a red voter than this, and here's why. You have to look at this equation, the 50% plus one. How many votes in this scenario would the red have to shift in order to take the moral narrative? If the red takes this vote here, actually, let me put this in red here because that'll be fun. Let's say if I'm doing this and the red takes this vote here, that's one vote, which turns this into a 50-50 split, which means the red could potentially win this outright. A second vote here, and that's in a 50-50 split, so the red could win, and a red vote here, right? So that ends up being a 50-50 split as well. So with three votes changed, the red could take control of the moral making process uh, or the process of deciding moral restraints. Over here, the red would have to take one, two, three, four, five votes to give themselves a similar advantage. And so that's why I would consider this a more fair map than this. The other thing that's consideration here, and we'll see this play out, is a lot of people are looking at how partisan um, Congress is getting. The red are getting more conservative, the blue are getting more liberal. Uh, we see this play out in the data. And one of the reasons why we're seeing that is because of the articulation of these kind of districts. If I have a district that's overwhelmingly filled with blue voters, then what's going to happen is I'm not going to get a slightly blue uh, um, representative here. I'm going to get a very blue representative. Mean, there's no contradiction. I mean, here I'm going to have a blue blue. Here I'm going to have red red. If I have six blue and four red, I'm going to have a balanced candidate here. If a candidate goes too far to the blue here, he may lose one of his moderate voters that could cost him the next election. So having these kind of middle ground toss up competitive districts actually guarantees that a candidate cannot go too far right or too far left. Um, and so this is kind of a reality where, um, like I said, the New York Times kind of labels these. I disagree. Um, like I said, I think this is a better map than the first one. Now, this third one is where we see shenanigans happening. Because what I see in this map is if the red is able to draw lines, notice what we can do. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I still have 10 vote or 10 voters in a given district, and I'm still going to pull one voter to represent that district. However, because of the way I've constructed this, the six red voters now outvote the four blue, giving red a victory there. Six red voters, red wins here too. Six red voters, four blue, red wins here too. Now, I can look at this and say, yeah, but blue is going to win two very hyper kind of elections, and you're right. 
blue wins this one right here. They're going to be a very blue candidate. And I'm going to have a very blue candidate here. Nine blue and one red. Nine blue and one red here. And so I'm going to have two very insanely liberal Democrats in this, uh, in this representative assembly. But it doesn't matter because you need 50% plus one. In that world, once you get to three votes, you control the lawmaking process. And so what red has done is even though most of the people in this state are blue or lean blue or likely vote blue, by controlling how the groups are constructed, they have guaranteed themselves the controlling force in making law. Now, a lot of students look at this like Crosby, this, this has to be illegal. It's not. It's completely legal. It's completely fair. It's the way it is. And a lot of people out there are arguing against it. But the argument, it, it centers, rests on like, how can you how can you make this illegal, right? You would have to say it's illegal to correctly predict how people vote. It's illegal to correctly predict the future. Like I said, gerrymandering only works because I can look at a state and say these voters are likely to vote Republican, these voters are likely to vote Democrat, and as long as I can guarantee a certain bifurcation of Democrat and Republican voters, then whoever controls the groups can guarantee any number of outcomes. So in this situation, I have six groupings, right? And all you have to do to figure out, if I want to tell you who drew these lines, District 1, right, the elephants win. All right, so Republicans win. District 2, Republican win. District 3, Republicans win. District 4, Republicans win. I don't have to go any further than that. Why? Because if I have six representatives, you need 50% plus one. 50% of six is three plus one equals four. Whoever gets to four votes first wins the moral narrative. Once the Republicans have one, two, three, four, they control. It doesn't even matter what happens in these. And again, you're going to see this kind of play out. See how this last district has all Democrats in it? The reason they do that is because they pack as many of the opposing party into one district because it frees up the mathematical advantage in the other areas. And so very often when you see competitive areas out here, you're going to see these kind of non-competitive areas. And so it's a lot of times students have the tendency of saying, look at all these Democrats. A Democrat must have drawn these lines. Not so fast. If you have a lot of one party shoved in the same group, a lot of times you have to look at the broader picture on who controls. That 50% 50, uh, 50 plus one is critically important. So if we look at this, this is the way that the presidential uh, or the this is the way the congressional maps used to look in Texas. So if I look at the 2020 presidential election, here we are, District 31 right here in the middle, right? It used to be a smaller district. We had Bell County reached into Round Rock, Georgetown and whatnot. But what we saw is that a lot of these were in this light pink area, which means the Republicans won these light pink areas, but they won them narrowly. They did not have great victories in these areas. Meanwhile, District 13, 19, 11, 4, 1, 8, these more rural areas, those are areas where Donald Trump won by more than 40%. And so what I have is in the 2020 election, based on the demographics, based on the polling results, based on the election results, I know I have a lot of extra Republican votes out here, and I've got a lot of tight races here in the middle. So what were we to do? The Texas legislature got together and drew new lines. 2020, we had a census. Um, after the census, Texas gained two more votes. We have to create 38 new lines. And so we did. And so now, um, if you look at this right here, you're going to see this area in the middle. This is the demographics that would have won. So you see here, a lot more of this now in Texas is going to be solidly red, and a lot less of it is going to be in that highly competitive. Well, how did we do that? We did that by increasing the number of guaranteed Democrat districts. A lot of people say like, yeah, but Crosby, why would the Republicans right, give the Democrats more votes in Congress? And the answer to that question is this, because it eliminates the competitive areas. It eliminates the number of areas where the Republicans aren't sure they'll win. Yes, we increased the number of Democrat votes, but we also increased the number of Republican votes. And remember, we're only looking at 50% plus one. 
That's the point. If you look at any state, where is that threshold? And can I gerrymander that state beyond that threshold? What we have guaranteed is that the votes from Texas will be balanced in favor of the Republican Party because the Republican Party controls the politics of Texas. They get to control Texas state lines, right? And so what we see, we see plus five guaranteed Democrats lines plus two Republican lines, right? We eliminate the middle. Overwhelmingly, we see negative five highly competitive seats. So when we're looking at this partisan nature, this growing kind of tension and divide in the American political spectrum, one of the biggest reasons we're seeing that divide is because gerrymandering is getting very, very sophisticated. And what we're doing when we gerrymandering is we're taking more and more districts out of com competition and we're throwing them into a guaranteed Republican win or a guaranteed Democrat win. In any given election, guys, only about 13% of these elections are actually competitive. Because of gerrymandering, we have already predetermined how most of these are going to do. So if you take District 31, right? So previously, District 31 in 2020 for the Biden-Trump election, right? Biden would have won or won in this district 48% of the votes that were cast in the previous District 31, right? Going into 2022 and 2024, this is the new district. So they redrew same area, but now we have this kind of like J looking area. And in this district, Trump would have won 59% of the vote and 38% of that vote would have went for Biden. Notice the difference, 48 to 38%. We saw a 10 point swing in favor of the Republican. So what used to be kind of a growing competitive district in District 31 is now not a competitive district at all. Um, and so this is why it's so important to understand kind of how this works out. The other thing about District 31 um, is it used to be kind of like this area over here in Colleen, right? Underneath the new District 11, now we reach into that same area of Colleen and those voters vote all the way out with Midland. Um, under the new ones. Why? Because we have a lot of Republican voters out here that counterbalances some of the more Democrat voters in uh, the south side of the Colleen heading down um, down Fort Hood Way. Uh, not Fort Hood Way, but outside of Fort Hood. So when we look at that, who's gerrymandering? The answer to that question is everybody. Everybody's doing it. Uh, California is overwhelmingly gerrymandered, specifically Southern California. Um, Illinois is one of the most politically corrupt areas, um, but they have used this for, for decades. Maryland as well, highly Democrat state, uh, been relying on, uh, on gerrymandering for some time. Most of this Northeast is done. Most of the, I mean, I mean if, you're, if you look at the map, the darker the area, the more likely that political gerrymandering was involved. The less like the area, the less likely. And it seems that um, the only states that don't have a lot of evidence of gerrymandering are the states that only have one vote, uh, which means the entire state is their group. So if they don't draw lines, uh, like me right here, I am now in Alaska, we have effectively one group. The entire state of Alaska is one group so we all get one house of representative representative member we still get two senators right but we only get one representative because there's just not enough people living in alaska and so when we start looking at this from a conceptual design we can see the most democrat areas the most republican areas and a lot of the reason we're seeing this shrinking divide is this if you look at even from 1997 we used to have this kind of third party swing state. Um, and so Congress was very, very competitive. Um, as Republicans and Democrats have gotten better at this, we have actually seen moderate increases in both the Republicans and Democrats. So we haven't really seen one advantage over the other, but what we have seen is this obliteration of this third party, this independent, this kind of competitive area. And the reason for this is AI. Um, AI has really taken on where I have computers that I can put in algorithms based on 30 years of voting and I can tell the computer to pop out maps that tell me anything. So if I want to say, computer, give me a Republican friendly advantage and 
and it gives me a Republican friendly advantage. Um, if I want the computer to pop out a Democrat advantage, it is. Now, you'll hear in politics that, oh, these lines are racist, uh, these lines are prejudiced, these lines, guys, most of the lines today aren't racist, they're not prejudiced, they're done based on AI, based on the likeliness of partisan voting. However, the racial component comes into the equation when you look at the African-American vote. Since African-Americans typically vote upwards of 90% Democrat, a computer cannot tell the difference between African-American voters and Democrat voters. Well, Republicans will say those lines were drawn because they vote Democrat. Democrats will say the lines are drawn because they vote African-American. Most likely what we're seeing is computer drew those lines, not a human being. Um, and so when we look at the sophistication of modern technology, it's important to kind of understand how these lines are being drawn, why they're being drawn, and to what advantage they're being drawn if we're going to begin to develop ways to resolve this issue. Because what we're seeing is what the two major political parties have done have created an advantage where they effectively control the system in a much greater way than they ever have. But this is leading to a greater kind of frustration between the two parties. And this middle ground, this third party, it's the one kind of being diminished and we're seeing that. So as we look at this one, we see these blinds are passed, uh, maps are passed. Uh, recently, the state of Texas redrew lines in the middle of a um, census year. Um, this all went all the way to uh, the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said the states can redraw lines effectively whenever they want to now. Um, so even though the lines were here for one congressional, the lines can continue to be redone and redrawn. And so if the a, a political party can take hold of a state, then that political party can effectively gerrymander that state to guarantee that that state legislature is controlled by whatever political party they want and that the representative they send to Washington is also um, controlled by their political party. And so a lot of what we're seeing today is really not the product of voting. It's really not the product of um, elections. It's not the product of narratives uh, or really well-run campaigns. Um, a lot of these campaigns are predetermined. And, and like I said, one of the reasons we do this is if I have a lot of these really hyper red areas, we don't spend a lot of money there. Um, the political parties work nationally to pull money from a lot of these very, very Republican areas and very, very Democratic areas. And then they spend that money in the more competitive areas. Um, this is why we see Southern California. Um, we see a lot of Democrat money being raised here and it's being spent down here in Central Texas. Why? Because the Democrats in California, because they own California, they already have control of these districts. They want to control some of these votes right here because they're still trying to get to that 50% plus one of the 435 members of the House of Representatives. And so it's not beyond a state legislature to look beyond their state into spending money and developing strategies that they're not only just controlling the state narrative, they're controlling the national narrative as well. And so as we look at gerrymandering and who's doing this, um, it's very, very important to keep all of these nuances in the back of your mind um, and, and kind of keep in mind, if we're gonna fix this system, we have to understand what's the problem. Leadership and whatnot, I'm gonna let you do this. The book covers this very, very well. Um, you can scatter all this about party ideology. Um, next time we meet, U.S. Senate as well, I'm not going to get into. Cover this in words we live by. Um, it's pretty straightforward when we get into the Senate. It used to be the hands of the states. Now it's hands of the people. We've already talked about this in class. Um, and so I've got the notion. The biggest thing with the Senate is the voting. Only what, what happens in the Senate is one third is elected every other year. So your state is on a rotational basis uh, when it comes to election and sentence, and it's important to understand that. So that part in the book, make sure you kind of pay attention to that election cycle. Um, the other big thing about the Senate is um, in a part of this kind of checks and balance, the vice president of the United States is also the president of the Senate. Uh, so Kamala Harris is technically the controlling member of the Senate. She's the presiding officer. So if the Senate is dysfunctional, uh, it's really the vice president. Now, having said that, 
the only vice president historically to kind of take up this role is John Adams. John Adams took this role very seriously. Um, and today the vice presidency, we'll talk about them a little bit later, but the vice presidency really has this kind of ambiguous role uh, where they're either kind of like the um, the presidential kind of do what I need you to do in order to benefit my role and my status, which is why vice presidents don't have a great run for presidents. Um, but it really is kind of complicated to understand the vice president. Constitutionally though, the vice president's only constitutional role is in Congress as president of the Senate. So make sure as you look at words we live by, you kind of run through all this um, and, and, and look at that one. Impeachment, we're going to cover this when we get into the presidency. Um, Congress does have the powers to impeach, um, but it's a two-step process that happens with both of them, and we'll cover that a bit later. So make sure you kind of pay attention to that as you walk through this. Like I said, the words we live by goes section and verse of the Constitution, so it goes through all of this. The next time we meet on Wednesday, I'm going to briefly go over the process of making law, um, and, but this is really going to be done, um, like I said, through other videos. But I do want to unpack on Wednesday for you the kind of sophistication of what laws Congress was supposed to be making. So we're going to look at Article 1, Section 8 um, on Wednesday. Until then, I bid you all adieu. Um, hopefully this is getting to all of you, and hopefully it's not as boring as it may seem to be. But y'all do very well.